Now, can you see me? Okay, we're recording. You can start your presentation anytime. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, is there still an uh uh? What's this? That's a light. Is that better? Oh, we got yes, it's all around. Thank you for coming and welcome to the final event in the Community Chairs 2010 Ornell campaign. In just a moment, I'll introduce our speaker, who's from IAMS Nature Center. IOMS is one of about 50 Community Shares member groups. And I want to say a, a, a few words about Community Shares. Like United Way and complementary to United Way, Community Shares is a federation of charitable nonprofit groups that work together to create a better quality of life. And not only do Community Shares member groups work to alleviate problems, hunger and poverty, inadequate health care, violence, discrimination, environmental degradation, but they also work to mitigate the root causes of those problems. Community Shares is the only charitable federation in Tennessee that includes conservation groups and the Humane Society. We as uh, UT Battelle employees can com contribute to Community Shares through payroll deduction. And in um, our mail recently, we got these things one of them is a brochure that gives lots of information about Community Shares member groups. And the other is a flyer. And on the back is the Community Shares authorization form. This is how you can easily, conveniently, painlessly contribute to Community Shares. And also this year, we are introducing the gift donation. Um, this is a it's a way to make a gift to community shares in honor of your friend or family member. Now this is a meaningful, impactful gift. It is low waste and it requires no shopping. <laughs> we also have these certificates. There's some available on the table and they're available on our website, self-service. So if you contribute to community <coughs> shares, you can print out the certificate and it'll let the person that you know, um, know that you, the let the person that you honor know that you contributed to community shares. So this is a way to contribute to our community and to honor your friends and loved ones at the same time. Our, our campaign theme this year has been sustainability in the environment. And our partnership with the Sustainable Campus Initiative on several events has been a very good fit. Today's event is jointly sponsored by the ORNL Sustainable Campus Initiative. It is a long-term, comprehensive effort to move Ornell campus towards sustainability in its facilities and its operations, and to promote sustainability at work, at home, and in the community. The initiative began two years ago, which was before a new executive order was signed last year, requiring federal agencies to achieve ambitious greenhouse gas reduction goals. This new order makes the Sustainable Campus Initiative activities much more than just a nice thing to do. We are glad you're here, glad you're interested in creating a bird-friendly yard. Our speaker today is Stephen Lynn Bales. He's from IAMS Nature Center, as I mentioned. IAMS is a 275-acre wildlife sanctuary and environmental learning center for everyone and all ages. It's in Knoxville, as I mentioned. It's currently separate, uh, celebrating it's 100 year anniversary, and this is a great time to visit. Lynn is the author of two books, Natural Histories, Stories of the Tennessee Valley, and the recently released Ghost Birds, Jim Tanner, and the Quest for the Ivory-Billed Woodpecker. And I believe he has copies here. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn writes a fascinating blog, and his articles include one that was published in September in the Smithsonian Magazine. Lynn is a photographer, an artist, a storyteller, and a fifth-generation Gatlinburg native. We are privileged to have him here today to tell us about creating a bird-friendly yard. Let's welcome Lynn Bales. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Very good. I am a hillbilly from Gatlinburg. I do wear shoes when I come out to things like this. Uh, but uh, I grew up in Gatlinburg and went to Gatlinburg Pickman High School, so officially I am a hillbilly. Uh, first, a, a word about IMES. We are celebrating our 100th anniversary, and IMES is a community shares agency, so you can donate to IMES by uh, signifying us. Uh, IMES really did begin 100 years ago. Believe it or not, HP and Alice IMES bought 20 acres of property in 1910. They built a house and had four daughters in time. And those daughters became very active in scouting. And uh, the local Girl Scouts started coming to IMES to do workshops and programs and work on badges and to do day camps. We still have Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts that come to IMES uh, throughout the year. Uh, IMES, uh, uh, became kind of a, uh, even though it was a private property owned by the Imes family, and they created a 20-acre sanctuary for the plants and animals that live there. Uh, people in Knoxville and the surrounding area started visiting them in the 1930s and 40s. There was a streetcar that came up Island Home Avenue. Didn't quite make it all the way to their property. They would get out and walk the last block. But that streetcar is, uh, is preserved at the uh, East Tennessee Historical Center downtown, same car that was there. Uh, and over the course of time, people in the area, particularly on a Sunday afternoon, would come to visit HP and Alice. And if they had a bird question, they would talk to HP. If they had a flower or gardening question, they would talk to Alice. And it was just kind of a, even though it was private property, they welcomed everybody to come in. Uh, Mr. Imes passed away in 1954. Mrs. Imes passed away in 1965. And uh, the local garden clubs didn't want to lose what was there, that 20-acre sanctuary, didn't want it to be developed. And so they lobbied the uh, city of Knoxville to buy the property so it could become essentially a city park. But because it was going to be such a high-maintenance city park with all the gardens and all the programs, the garden clubs, uh, the ladies of the garden club said, we will do all the programs, we'll do all the, maintain all the gardens. So it was bought uh, by city money, by some federal money, and uh, even the garden clubs had raised some additional monies themselves to buy the original 20 acres. And the nature, after uh, uh, refurbishing the house and turning it into a visitor center, uh, if, uh, IMS officially opened in 1968 as a nature center. That was 20 acres then, and as Cindy said, technically we don't grow to 175 acres until this Saturday. We have the official ribbon cutting. If you're used to IMS, and sadly this is our brand new trail map, still wet with ink, but uh, the original IMS uh, was this property. Uh, Saturday we opened the what's known as the Ross Marble Natural Area. It's an old quarry. It'll be the second quarry we bring online. If you're familiar with Imes, Meads Quarry became part of Imes six years ago. And the second quarry lines up with Meads if you're familiar with the property and know that Meads Quarry is essentially a 25 flooded acre lake. Uh, they struck an underground stream while they were doing uh, quarrying there in the 1970s. A while, for a while they kept the water pumped out. But they got where they had removed all the high quality uh, uh, stone and was really just uh, taking out limestone and which proved not to be very profitable, so they turned the pumps off and it filled up and became this gorgeous lake at Meads Quarry property. That's been part of Imes officially now for six years. The second quarry, the Ross Marble Quarry, literally lines up the two quarry pits, if you look at an aerial view, and uh, I, that became part of Imes last year. It was really originally purchased by the Legacy Park Foundation locally. It's another nonprofit that accumulates property and then uh, to protect it to con uh, so it doesn't get developed and then they figure who's the best to manage it. In the case of Ross Marble, uh, it, since it's, it's adjacent to Meads Quarry, they had decided it should become part of Imes. For the past year, our poor uh, ground staff have been putting on trails and barriers. It's an amazing people pro piece of property. I hope you can visit the grand opening ribbon cutting. It's Saturday. It's like going down into a man-made canyon or an old Mayan ruin because it looks like they just stopped quarrying operation in the middle of the day. All of the cliffs are squared off, as you would imagine, and there's large blocks of uh, limestone squares just laying everywhere. Today, it's all covered with moss and ferns and vines, so it'll look like you've discovered this old Mayan ruin somewhere. It's a gorgeous piece of property, 
it's, uh, we're glad to bring it online. We think once everybody discovers it, people, a lot of people will start coming there and walking through it. The, the, our park staff put trails down into the pit and up around through the pit and then across a bridge that goes over the pit. It, it's just a gorgeous piece of property. If you're into mountain biking, the local mountain bike group put in a mountain bike course on one section of it. And that itself is, is a wonderful trail that's a mile and a quarter, as I recall, a loop that goes up and around. So that is this Saturday we have the grand opening. So please come to IMS. Uh, uh, we'd like to say we're one of Knoxville's best kept secrets. We're only three and a half miles from downtown Knoxville. But surprisingly, every I work on Saturdays, and almost every single Saturday somebody comes in and says, you know, I've never been here. Even people that live on Chapman Highway, which is two miles away, I've never been here. I'm glad I finally came. So please come and visit us. Uh, uh, we're free. The grounds are free. And the park is open 365 days a year. Uh, the police unlock the gate at daylight and lock it at dark. And so uh, it's really even on holidays. Uh, people come. And it's a, good, it's a good place to come after Thanksgiving and kind of walk off some of those extra pounds. And it'll be particularly good this year because we have this whole new piece of property to explore. Uh, so please come to IMES. As Cindy mentioned, I am an author, and once you become an author, you carry your book. You think once you turn in your manuscript, that's it. <laughs> but I learned, I grew up in the San Venerable School of Book Writing. You always carry your books with you. So I did bring copies, should anybody like to purchase one. My first book is Natural Histories. Uh, it is really 16 chapters. Each chapter is about a plant or an animal found in the Tennessee Valley. Uh, I'll actually start, speak a little bit about chickadees. That's one of the chapters. Uh, I look for plants and animals that not only had an interesting biology or ecology, how they get along in this life, but also had uh, kind of unique connections to our own history or Native American history. So that's uh, Natural Histories. Uh, Ghost Birds is my brand new book, literally right off the press. If you're familiar with the Ivory Bill Woodpecker, the famous ghost bird of the South, is it extinct? Is it not extinct? Luckily, I did not have to answer that because my book takes place 1935 to 1941. It covers the days that Jim Tanner, if you know the story of the Ivory Bill, you know that Jim Tanner was the man that literally wrote the book on the Ivory Bill. He was a grad student at Cornell University and received the first Audubon research grant to study an individual disappearing species and spent three years, it's a great job, could you imagine? He was, during the Depression, he spent three years, he was in his early 20s, traveling from swamp to swamp to swamp in the South in a Model A Ford where he could get it. Eventually he would get it stuck in the mud and have to just keep going, walk the rest of the way. Looking for the Ivory Bill Woodpecker, uh, his findings and research became his, uh, his dissertation for Cornell, that's how, where, when he, how he became Dr. James Tanner. And it eventually was released. The Audubon Society published it in 1942. Uh, it's still in print. Dover Publishing prints it now. But if you have an original copy of the first edition, Jim Tanner, it's worth about four to six hundred dollars today. It's one of the most highly sought after birding books out there. They're very hard to find. But my book takes place during that time, and I had an Aunt Nancy Tanner. Jim died in 1991. But Nancy, his widow, is still living. She's a good friend of Imes. She comes to Imes often. She lives very close to Imes. And she helped me with the book. She wrote the forward. And I, but I really used Jim's 400-page journal of everything he did all those years. It was fascinating. My, the hard part was to keep it the book this size. But that's Ghost Birds. Da, 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 da. There's the commercials. Now for the topic at hand, creating a bird-friendly yard. In the essence, Doing the same thing that H.P. and Alice Himes did to the 20 acres they bought, creating your own little wildlife sanctuary in your own backyard. Birds are the most popular thing to attract, mostly because there's so many. They're bright, they're colorful, and they're out in the daytime. And, uh, and they're fun to watch. This is the time of year that when it starts to get a little chilly and you don't spend quite as much time outdoors, but you want to be there by the window and see what's coming and going, coming and going from your yard. I brought, one of the handouts I brought is a list of Knox County birds. I know we're in Anderson County, but the list should be essentially the same as the one I've got here. Although occasionally I hear you guys get a red-headed woodpecker over in here, and we don't get those in Knox County as, as of yet that I know of. But this list has, uh, uh, I think it's a hundred, hundred and, without his glasses, 147 birds. And 
Each bird after the bird has a, a letter. It either is a P, a W, an S, or an M. If it's, uh, if it's a P, that means it's a permanent resident. It's here year round. Uh, cardinals, chickadees, crows, you know, those are here for 365 days a year. Carolina wrens are on your front porch every single day. If you open the door, they'll come and have tea with you. I mean, they're there. They're not shy. They'll build your, their nest absolutely anywhere. If you leave your car window down for three days, you're going to have a Carolina wren nest in it in the spring. Uh, the other birds on the list, uh, if it has an S after it, that means it's a summer resident. It's only here in the summertime, which kind of by definition it nests here. The uh, uh, hummingbird is by far, and we'll talk about it in a minute, by far the bird I get more phone calls about. Uh, if it is uh, ill, that means it's a migratory. It only passes through the Tennessee Valley in the spring and then returns in the fall, so you only see them for a few days. At Imes, we have scarlet tanagers around our parking lot for three or four days, maybe a week in the uh, in the spring. They're a gorgeous, bright red bird with black wings. They don't really go much farther. They go, they well, they do go further north, but they do nest in the Smokies. And so, if I had a list of Sevier County birds or Blount County birds, it would include a scarlet tanager as a summer resident. And that what that leaves there at the end is all the birds that are only here in the wintertime. So winter is a great time to be thinking about birds. There's a group of about 20 species that are only found here in the wintertime. And in addition, so this time of year, what you have in your backyard are all the permanent residents, but you then pick up a few of the winter residents, birds like the white-throated sparrow that you'll see feeding on the ground, uh, they tend not to come to the feeder, but they'll eat all the seeds that have dropped off. And that's the poor Sam, poor Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody bird. Uh, only here in the wintertime, uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker, one of our woodpeckers. Uh, we have five species of woodpecker year-round, but then the six species, the yellow-bellied sapsucker comes in. I've actually seen one already this fall. Uh, that's the bird. Uh, you know they're in your property because they drill those perfectly little round uh, sap circle wells or holes in trees that look like somebody stood there with his black and decker and went <laughs> They're in a line. They eat sap. That's the name. And even in a winter time on a warm day, a little sap will ooze out of those wells. And sometimes insects on a warm day get caught up in that sap. So the sap sucker, if it's in your area, in your yard, they tend to have several trees they're working on, and they keep those little wells open so that the sap leaks out, and they go from tree to tree to tree, and they go around and around all day long visiting. So that's a bird you can tell if you've got without ever seeing it because of those little holes. And you usually can tell if they're fresh holes or they're from earlier years because the tree does heal over. Uh, most of the books say they really don't harm the tree uh, because trees do heal those wounds themselves. That's why the sap sucker has to keep them open a little bit. But some trees, you'll notice year after year after year, they've drilled a whole new line of, uh, of wells. So that's the yellow-bellied sap sucker. That will be six different species of woodpecker you have in your yard. So that's this list. I did bring handouts. I hope I brought enough. If not, maybe we can get more copies made. I, this is a little bit... It's a little a larger group than I expected and much nicer surroundings. This is great resources. Um, this is a bit intimidating to talk with very large photographs of yourself behind you. <laughs> anyway, I just, I just invite everybody to look at the right side. That is a red-tailed hawk that I get to take care of at I'm. She's still there. She's a gorgeous bird. If you do uh, start uh, getting birds to your yard, you know you're going to want a, uh, uh, some sort of a field guide. To, uh, to figure out what you've got coming and going. Uh, there's a guy in the bird club, a friend of mine named Dan, uh, Dean. He moved to Cedar Bluff, just to give you a sense. Um, this is about 10 years ago. They hit his wife bought a house out there. In one year's time, they had 106 species identified in his backyard. So it is available out there. And the more things you can do to lure them in, uh, uh, the more you're going to see and start to identify. And once you get them going, once you've kind of created this little sanctuary, they'll, they'll stay with you. They're, they'll be very loyal. The first thing, uh, uh, the, let me look at the clock. Oh, we're doing great. Uh, really the things to think about are water, food, and shelter, i.e. places to hide and nest, and nest boxes or nesting materials. So that's the things to uh, keep in mind. And I think I'll do water first. This is the one most people... 
uh, kind of overlook and don't think about, bird baths are almost essential, particularly with summers like we just had when it is so dry for so long. Keeping a bird bath with fresh water in it, uh, birds will visit it not only all day long to take a drink, but literally to splash around and take a bath. Uh, if, if it is a bird bath, you can either have a bird bath or some sort of water feature that trickles or dribbles or falls, either or is fine. The bird bath, you do have a slight chance of mosquitoes, a very, if it is a, if you don't keep it cleaned out and dump the water every two or three days and put fresh water. Or you can buy this new gizmo here, which I've not tested. It's called a water wiggler and it runs on battery and you just set it down in the bird bath and it, I have a rock in the middle of mine so they hop on, but this would work just as well. But it jiggles and it keeps just a slight little ripple to the water and mosquitoes will not lay eggs and water that's rippling. And uh, so mosquitoes won't use it, plus the kind of ripply water will attract birds to it. They'll see it and come down. But in the wintertime, you don't really have to worry about mosquitoes, and it, but it's just as hard for birds to find water, particularly if it's, if it's very cold and everything's frozen. What I have at home is a heated bird bath. And it's not like one of those pools in Gatlinburg that is heated to, you know, 78 degrees. <laughs> it just keeps the water... Uh, above freezing and it's what I bought was a it's essentially a plastic bird bath that I plug in in the wintertime and on a very very cold day when everything else is kind of frozen it gets a lot of activity I remember about two winters ago I looked out and there was like eight bluebirds sitting at it sitting around the ring taking turns drinking and taking baths and you can know how they must have really appreciated that I normally don't get bluebirds because I live in the woods and to see them on a winter's day was very cheerful to have that little ring of bluebirds waiting for their baths. And, you know, it's like, oh, thank you, thank you. So that's the one thing to keep in mind. Uh, bird baths can be as simple as a large uh, ceramic uh, a pot or uh, basin that you would buy that you just, if you, it's just dump the water every two days and put fresh water in it or as elaborate as you want to spend. I got a phone call from, this was about eight years ago. I write a column in Farragut and have written it for 11 years. And I got a call, and I wrote a column about this. A guy lived in West Knoxville, and he had one of those three-tiered fountains and with water trickling from one tier to the other. and said, Lynn, I think I've got a bald eagle <laughs> taking a bath in my fountain. And, Is that possible? And I said, well, you're there. <laughs> what does it look like? <laughs> It's certainly possible, and he described it. You know, bald eagles are one of those birds that's pretty easy to identify. It's a massive bird with a white head, dark body, and a white tail. But he had a fenced-in yard, and he had done all these things that he did to attract other birds, including this gorgeous fountain, and a bald eagle cruising overhead. Looked down and said, hey, perfect, I got privacy, and I'll go down and take a bath. So it's possible even to get a bald eagle if you got a big enough basin. That's the only time I've ever heard that. But I get a lot of phone calls about Cooper's hawks. Cooper's hawks seem to be very fond of bird baths and waters feature. And a Cooper hawk is a long, lean kind of, it's in the genus occipiter. They're the basketball, uh, the fast uh, hawks uh, groups that we have. So any sort of a water feature or water bird bath. And you want to put these things where you can watch them because that's half the fun is just being able to sit there indoors in your breakfast nook or out on your deck and kind of watch all this activity. So I certainly recommend some sort of water, bird bath or water feature. They really need water, particularly in the heat of summer and in the cold of winter. Uh, next thing, of course, are bird feeders. Uh, the first thing uh, are seed feeders. I usually try to keep one seed feeder year round. Some people don't feed in the summertime, and that's okay. There tends to be if you're going to stop feeding, wait till about May or June because there's not a lot of ripe seeds early in the season. A lot of people, as soon as they see birds in their yard, will stop putting seeds in their feeder, say in April or May, or um, and or March or April, somewhere in that general area. And that's when the uh, uh, parent birds are feeding their young birds, and they really need to find food to feed. So you know they got extra mouths to feed, and the seed crop really isn't in that area, in that early. That so. I would try to keep, if you want to stop in the summer, that's okay, but I would keep seeds going at least and say to early June and then maybe slack off. But I always try to keep at least one feeder, seed feeder, all year round because that kind of keeps the birds loyal to you. 
and they don't move down to your neighbor's yard to their feeder. So keep uh, one feeder year-round with seeds, and uh, uh, as I get into winter time and the cold of winter, I usually crank up three or four other feeders around the property. People ask what's the best seeds. Um, so you can, really can't go wrong with sunflower seeds, uh, either the black oil or the gray striped, whatever you can find, uh, uh, because most birds eat them, even the little guys will crack them open and eat, uh, eat, the, eat um, the uh, pulp that's inside and all the way up to the bigger ones like uh, uh, cardinals. Um, you see, this time of year, and this is in my book, Natural Histories, the first chapter is about chickadees. And this time of year, you'll see the chickadees coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. And they're, you know, they're only just being, how in the world are they eating so many sunflower seeds? My goodness, you'd think they'd weigh as much as a dove. Truth is, this time of year, they start hiding seeds. They do a thing called scatter hoarding. Tip mice do the exact same thing, uh, where they, uh, most of the seeds they're leaving with, they hide. And they hide each seed in a different spot. It's not like the squirrel that piles up acorns in, in a hollow tree somewhere. Eat, the chickadees and the tip mice do it, both do it. They may hide as many as a thousand seeds, each in a different location, all around your yard, in a pine cone here, under a leaf there, in a piece of bark here, everywhere. So they kind of take care of it. The day you forget to fill up your feeder, they've taken care of that. They got them everywhere. And I've watched, I've watched a, a tip mouse with bouncing around my deck looking for a place to stash this seed. And it finally noticed a barbecue grill and hopped up inside and hid it somewhere in the barbecue grill. So they remember that. In fact, they've done studies where a chickadee's hippocampus in the fall swells, gets bigger, because that's the part that controls memory. And they've got to memorize where they've, where they've hidden a thousand different seeds. And, they, and studies seem to uh, indicate that they can do that. Now, a lot of those seeds are found by something else. You know, the nuthatch is working his way down the tree. And, whoa, here's a sunflower seed. And he'll eat the sunflower seeds. So they think maybe as much as 40% of those thousand are either found by nuthatches or raccoons or squirrels. But that still leaves maybe roughly 600 seeds that each individual bird has hidden. So don't think of the tip mice and the, um, and the chickadees are just uh, uh, are being greedy. They're really kind of taking care of winter. They're storing. It's called scatter hoarding. Uh, if you want to do a mix, that's okay too. Sometimes I'll have a, uh, just, you know, you, you're, trying to be, uh, uh, you're trying to be good to them, so you, you give them some variety. If you want to put a mix of seeds and another feeder, the only thing, here's a good blend right here. This has got some sunflower, some cracked corn. We've got some niger seeds and some millet. Uh, the only thing to avoid, if you buy a cheaper bag of seeds, it will be very high milo. It's M-I-L-O. Uh, the ingredients are usually listed on the back, and it sometimes are 50 or 60% milo. Milo is a seed that really nobody eats or uh, other than a morning dove if it's kicked down on the ground they will eat most some of it. But Milo, it's filler. And it's easy to tell, as I said, if you buy a box, a bag of seeds, just look on the box or look on the bag. And if the first ingredient is Milo, you know, well, it's probably 50% filler. You've seen the chickadees on your feeder, you know, they're doing this or sorting seeds. and It's like Milo, 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 Milo. <laughs> now, the morning doves are on the ground. They're, they're going to take care of part of that. But that's all they're doing is sorting out that Milo and they're creating a mess so they can get to the sunflower seeds or the millet or something like that. So usually a, a little more expensive bag, and it's called premium blend or Martha Stewart blend or something like that. It's basically saying no Milo, but you can easily tell. So that's the seed to avoid is Milo. Usually in, uh, in uh, the wintertime, I put down my, let's do winter first, and then I'll segue back to summer. Usually by October, I take my uh, hummingbird feeders down by the end of October. And that's when I start putting up my uh, suet feeders. Suet is, uh, is, is a great attractant for all birds, but especially woodpeckers. Essentially, su I tell kids, suet is like crushed up bugs and insects. That's why birds that migrate, migrate, most of the birds that do migrate, uh, they're insect eaters in the summertime. Or in the wintertime, there's not that many insects. And so you can replace some of those insects with, uh, with suet. Now, you can buy your own suet cakes. I love this feeder here. I had trouble. 
with the other kind of suet feeders, the suet would disappear. The suet cake would disappear in the middle of the night. And I go, wait a minute. That's not a squirrel in the middle of the night. Uh, it could have been a flying squirrel, but a flying squirrel couldn't eat a whole cake. And we really don't care about, you know, we don't mind feeding flying squirrels because we all grew up watching Rocky and Bullwink and we had this soft plate. <laughs> you know, if a moose comes to our backyard, or a flying squirrel, we're fine with that. You know, we just, that's that Rocky and Bullwinkle influence. But I really had a, got a suspicion that it was probably a raccoon, because only a raccoon could eat this much suet overnight. And I had read, this happened about say, uh, five or six years ago, I had read about hot pepper suet. Birds really have very few taste buds, so they don't really notice the zip in this. But, uh, so I bought a, I had bought a, uh, uh, a hot pepper suet cake, and these are available at all the, I think, major retail places that sell bird supplies. But I hadn't tested it yet, and I did have a feeder just like this, and I had it up on the back deck where I can reach and pull it down and, and change the suet cake. And I was on the sofa watching, and as I said, you want these things to be where you can enjoy them from indoors. And it was, it was late one afternoon. In fact, I think the sun was going down, and here came this lumber, this big raccoon. And it climbed up on the a railing and was able to stand on its back legs and pull this cage down and reach in and eat my suet cake. Now that, that was a little irritating because they were going to eat the whole thing. And so I had already bought this, but I hadn't tested it. And I thought, well, this is a good thing to test. So I slipped, I walked out on the deck very slowly and the raccoon lumbered down and ran over to the corner of the deck. I didn't want to spook it. I wanted to watch, me. I wanted to switch the cake. So I switched the cake out and put it back and went back to the sofa and waited. And sure enough, the raccoon came back, reached up and grabbed the uh, cage and reached in and took like two bites. Went <laughs> <laughs> you know, he thought, my God, what happened to this restaurant? They went caging on me. <laughs> it could not stand it. It kept wiping, it, wiping its face off. And, you know, I felt sorry for the little zip it got, but it didn't ever come back. You know, he said, I'm going to... I'll go down to the neighbor's house. They're still serving American cuisine down there. Uh, so uh, that's hot pepper suet. I've, it never did come back. Uh, but you can buy these cakes, as I said, anywhere. But another great thing to do, I save all of these little plastic containers that they come in. And over the course of years, I think I have about 20 of these now. So I make my own suet cakes. And around December, when it really does start getting chilly, I've got one crock pot which I keep, it's a little one that I, you know, you remember y'all used to have five or six crop pots? Well, I've got one that I use just in December and I will uh, make my own suet. And what I do is go buy lard. You now you have to buy it. We all grew up where lard was everywhere. And my, your, your parents kept one right there on the stove. But I go buy a, a block of lard and I melt it in the crock pot and then fill that hot lard with uh, bird seed uh, with peanut butter, dollops of peanut butter, just really chunk it up good. And then I'll line up my 20 little dishes like this and pour it in it and put them all in the bottom of the refrigerator. And I've made all the suet I'll need uh, for the whole winter. So I've kind of uh, uh, recycled these little things. So I rarely buy anymore. I do keep a hot pepper cake uh, around in the cupboard just in case I have trouble with, an, uh, with, I think I'm having trouble with another raccoon. So that's suet. And the other, like I said, not only will wrens, chickadees, tip mice, and the, uh, and jays, and, uh, come to this for what suet has that the seeds don't have is a lot of fats, obviously, and, uh, uh, uh proteins that they won't get from these things. And it's a good thing for wintertime. And, uh, uh, but that's, uh, suet is a good, th I usually keep the suet out until, uh, about April when I switch and take the suet down and start putting up my hummingbird feeders. Another activity you can do, which is quite fun, um, is uh, you can create a suet log. Just save a log like this and get your, uh, you know, if you've got frustration, if you're upset with your supervisor or something, you just go out into your garage and, and fill it full of holes and then you can use this for a suet feeder and then crank it way up a tree. Uh, squirrels will find it, <laughs> so you do have to worry about that. But pileated woodpeckers will come to this and they won't come to this because they feel kind of uncomfortable balancing on this. And this is sort of a natural thing for a pileated to come to. So they'll come and clean, literally clean this all out 
and then every two weeks or so you'll bring it back down and fill it back up with either the suet you've made or even just straight peanut butter and sprinkle some seeds on it. So that's kind of a homemade activity you can do at home and kids can help do this. They like, they enjoy going out in the garage and, uh, you know, uh, creating this kind of blog. I do get a lot of people ask me, how do I attract Pileated woodpeckers, and a pileated woodpecker is the largest species of woodpecker we have in this area. It is a, it's kind of a sister species, sister looking to the ivory bill. They fed differently and in different areas. But uh, uh, the best thing I know uh, to attract them is the next time you cut down a tree, lay a couple of logs around your property and let those logs lay there. Uh, the difference between an ivory bill and uh, a pileated as far as what they fed on Ivory bills would look for tree that had been dead less than two years. They were stronger birds and could rip the bark and rip into a tree that had known dead two years or less than two years. After it's been dead been two years and that bark is starting to really loosen up and under the bark is filled with carpenter ants and um, beetle larvae, that's when the pileated would take over and they'll come to those logs that you have laying around your property and just shred them, turn them into mulch after they've been there for two years. I've done this several times and uh, and literally what's left by the end of it is just a pile of kind of chipped up um, uh, mulch. So that's one way of attracting pileated woodpeckers to your, to your property. Another activity we do at Imes every December is to make uh, pine cone suet feeders where you take, uh, save your pine cones around and you can decorate them with ribbons and yarn and then fill these with peanut butter and sprinkle it all with uh, uh, seeds. Uh, a great thing to do with kids at Christmas time is to pick an evergreen outside one of the windows and make, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 of these and hang them all over the tree with bright red ribbon. And the birds just literally come and go from that. So it's kind of a great gift for birds. When uh, at Imes every December we do a hol holiday craft party. It's usually the first Saturday in the month. And uh, this, I'm at the Pinecone Suet Station and have done it for years, so I, we make a lot of these for the kids. So that's suet, okay? As I said, let me look at the clock. As I said, usually in April, I take my suet feeders down, and that's when I move over to hummingbird feeders. I get a lot of phone, this is by far the bird I get more phone calls about, more emails about is the uh, ruby-throated hummingbird. It's everyone's favorite. It's the tiniest bird in the area. And uh, they're so tiny. I love this. A healthy hummingbird weighs the equivalent of two dimes. So the next time you're holding two dimes, that's how much a hummingbird weighs. You wonder, how could that little dynamo who weighs so little be so energetic? They're so energetic because they drink sugar water all day long. It's like you and I drinking Coke all day long. I usually, uh, the first, the, the number one question I usually get is when to put out the hummingbird feeders. Uh, the best rule of thumb is crazy day to crazy day, April Fool's Day to Halloween. Uh, we tend not to quite get them as early as the first week of April, but it's possible. But that's just a good thing to remember, crazy day to crazy day. Usually about around April 10th, April 12th, we start getting them in the, in the area. If you want to plant or find a red buckeye, that's a native buckeye species, and plant that in your yard, uh, studies have shown that ruby-throated hummingbirds follow the blooming red buckeyes up in the spring, and of course they bloom earlier in Florida. So as the red buckeyes are blooming northward, that's when the hummingbirds arrive, and I do have a couple of red buckeyes in my yard. And so when I start to see the and red buckeyes are a hummingbird f uh, favorite, they have uh, red tubular flowers. Uh, when they're blooming, I know the hummingbirds are probably back, so that's an indicator species plant-wise to look for a couple of red buckeyes to plant around your yard. And they usually start blooming around April 10th, April 15th, somewhere in Pax Day, somewhere in there. Uh, but th I, this is the kind of feeder I prefer. It's called a saucer feeder where the, uh, the sugar water, and make your own sugar water. It's just four parts water, one part sugar. It does not need that red dye in it whatsoever because most of the feeders have red on them and the hummingbirds are kind of irresistibly drawn to this color. In fact, if you're just starting with hummingbirds uh, and you want to, you put your feeder out and you're not attracting them, uh, you can do all kinds of tricks to kind of lure them to your yard. One thing is to scatter a lot of red around your property, tie red ribbons from trees, 
or a red party napkins is hanging from trees, and a passing hummingbird is going to notice all of this, you know, all these little spots of red, and they'll fly down and investigate and go from ribbon to ribbon to ribbon until they actually find the feeders. And then once they find your feeder, they're going to come and go, come and go from the feeder. Uh, but I usually start keeping the feeders out um, in early April, like I said. I uh, mix up a half gallon of sugar water and keep it in the refrigerator and try to fix it. The, w the other good thing to have is a is a bird f uh, hummingbird feeder. The other kind are called gravity feeders, where there's usually a stem at the bottom, and those work too. But they'll drip, 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 and maybe put a little messy puddle on your deck where these won't drip. And because these, because it's a, a saucer of nectar, and you can buy them bigger than this, uh, they will literally perch because they're feeding straight down, not up. And so they may perch a while and get, let, give you a better chance to see them. But this kind will not attract yellow jackets because a yellow jacket's tongue is not long enough to feed, to lick up the sugar water, whereas the other kind, the gravity feeders, and I actually have, end up, I do have both at the house. Uh, the yellow jackets can come to them because there's the water, uh, the sugar water drips out. All sugar is, all the sugar water is, is imitation nectar. That's one of the hummingbird's principal foods. They fly from flower to flower to flower and for nectar. Uh, and nectar is not all four parts water, one part sugar. It varies, but through trial and error, if you mix it to that strength, I've had a lot of people call and say, I mix it a lot richer in sugar. That's fine, uh, but they won't come as often. Through trial and error, they've discovered that four part water, one part sugar, you'll get them a routinely, they'll visit more often because you get them slightly weaker than they can find in some flowers. Flowers vary from, from a very rich sugar to a very weaker. And so that's just a good uh, rule of thumb is four to one. Uh, but probably the misnomer, uh, everyone thinks that hummingbirds just eat sugar water, just drink sugar water. And you and I couldn't exist on that diet for long. They eat lots and lots of insects. When they come to flowers, not only do they sip the nectar, uh, they'll grab every insect they can see around the flower. So the other thing, people that really get into hummingbirds, and I, I, there are several people that in the height of hummingbird season, they may have 10 or 12 feeders going, but they've got a yard full of red flowers. I did bring a list. Yes, there's one of the handouts is a list of some of the hummingbird um, uh, favorite flowers. But if you can find flowers, like I mentioned, red buckeye, but flowers that bloom all through the season, uh, that's uh, because not only will, do they need nectar, they need all the insects. The other call I get most often is usually May and June. Where are the hummingbirds? I haven't seen one at my feet in a long time. During May and June, they're really feeding their babies, and they really don't, they, you know, a growing... Uh, nestling can't grow very well under sugar water. And so during that time, they're really visiting flowers predominantly because there's, they're sipping up the nectar and they're eating all the insects, and that's what they regurgitate. Have we all had lunch? <laughs> you, can you imagine a baby hummingbird gets a mouthful of nectar and bugs? But that's what they grow on, they eat that protein. So I, get a lot, I often get a phone call. Late May or June, where are the hummingbirds? I have not seen one. I said, well, be faithful. Keep your feeders out. Pretty soon, your yard is going to have all the infant hummingbirds or all the fledgling hummingbirds flying around. You're going to have triple the amount of hummingbirds. Traditionally, a female hummingbird will have two nests with two in each nest, and they may actually overlap. She may be tending eggs in one nest and two nestlings in the other nest, but, you know, she's got the energy. She's flying from nest to nest to nest and down to the feeder and over to the flower. So she's really very, very active. You don't, uh, it's a wonder she doesn't burn herself out. Uh, but by the time you get into July, that's when all of a sudden you got a lot of hummingbirds. Hummingbirds uh, migrate. They do start migrating early by the end of July, usually. All the adult males will leave the yards, and all the adult males that made it as far north as Canada will will flow back through, and so it's the adult males that leave first, followed by the adult females from, from the Tennessee Valley and the further north. And what, by the time you get into, say, August, it's just all of those young ones, and they're skinny, and they're trying to fight and fatten up, and they fight with each other, and they bang around at the feeders. I get a, people call me and say, how can I stop this? They're wrapping each other. And they're like teenagers. You can't stop them. I've seen them grab each other and fall to the ground punching. You know, it's just like those two teenagers in the bedroom. 
What is going on up there? Oh, nothing, nothing. You know what's going on up there. They're punching each other in the ground. Don't worry about it. They're learning tenacity because when the hummingbirds get to Central and South America, after making that long hop across the Gulf of Mexico, they're the little guys down there. There's a lot of very large hummingbird spe species uh, when you get down in there. And so our guys are just learning to fight for themselves, to, 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 to dominate a flower or a plant and take care of it. So that's all that's going on. Okay, so that's hummingbirds. <laughs> Let's get into nest boxes. Uh, once you've got all of this activity going, once you've got people, you got feeders, you got you got bird baths, you got hummingbird feeders. Uh, you want to have some of those people nest. I mean, some of those birds to nest around you. There's a uh, I one of the sheets up here is how to build your basic bluebird box, which is this one. But this same box also works for uh, Carolina chickadees, tough tip mice, Carolina wrens. I live in the woods and have nest boxes all around my house. And I never really get nesting bluebirds because bluebirds want a field or property. They'll nest at the edge of woods, but they, they feed in the broad or a broad backyard if your backyard's big enough. So they just want open space. They eat insects primarily. But if you put up nest boxes just like this all around your house, even if you live in the woods, I get every one of my nest boxes is used more than once, and it's by those, those species. The one I had most trouble with was getting a tip mouse to use one of the boxes. I never could figure out why because all the books said so. But they would use the box until I finally found a book that said they rarely nest below 15 feet. Oh boy, that's going to be that's going to be a tall post for me, for me to put the box on the top of it. And then I realized that my, I have a second floor deck and a wood sided house, and I just nailed a nest box. I reached out as far as I could and nailed the box to the side of my house. And to me, it's cleanable and reachable. But to the tip mice, it's 15 feet above the ground. And every year, I get tip mice at that one box. The other boxes, I get Carolina. I'm, Carolina wrens and Carolina chickadees. So even if you don't expect bluebirds, if you don't have any broad open area, then you can still use the same box. And as I said, I, one of the handouts is the basic instructions on how to build a bluebird box. Uh, this kind of standard uh, uh, shape has, is through trial and error has come, uh, been pulled together. The key measurements are your nest hole is an inch and a half uh, because if it's bigger, a starling can use it, and so that's that's a key measurement. You want an overhang in a lip like this, and six inches from the bottom of the hole to the bottom of the, the floor, because a raccoon cannot sit on this and reach around and grab a baby. So the, a lot of trial and error went into this kind of basic shape. But on the back of this, it's it's how to modify this size-wise so you can attract all different kinds of other birds that may want a bigger box like the bird that's right in here. So that's, um, let me look, oh, we've got time. So that's uh, nest boxes. You can put as many as you want around and as more, more acreage you have around. Obviously, the more you can scatter about. If you do want to attract bluebirds uh, and you do have proper habitat, which is a field, a meadow, or just a very large backyard, uh, you can put up more than one bluebird box as long as they're 100 yards apart. That's a magic number. You can put two boxes side by side, and you'll get bluebirds in one and chickadees in the other maybe, but you'll never get two bluebirds. They're very territorial, but 100 yards is kind of the magic uh, distance. Or if you put a bluebird box on one side of your house and another one on the other side of the house where they can't see each other, then they can be closer together or maybe a shed that blocks the view. But if they can see each other, they will not, uh, one pair of bluebirds will not allow another pair to nest uh, closer than 100 yards. So that's bluebird boxes. Uh, but it's, if you've got the property and acreage, you can put up a bluebird trail where each box is, say, 100 yards apart, and you'll get bluebirds. Uh, I saw a bluebird on the way out here this morning sitting on the line. Bluebirds are one of the great birds to attract. They are here year round. The other question I often get about bluebird boxes is what direction should they face? And it really does not matter at all. There's been all kinds of studies. Uh, in fact, I have a friend up in, um, in Sevier County that's got about 30 bluebird boxes out around his property. And how he works it is he mounts the box to a PVC pipe 
and the PVC pipe will keep black rat snakes from climbing it because it's too slick, or raccoons, and then he sl and the PVC pipe is about six feet long. And then that slips over your traditional metal uh, fence post or barbed wire. So he drives a fence post in the ground and then just slips this long tube that's got the box hooked to the top. And so he literally, if he wants to move it, if for some reason it's not being used for whatever reason, then he can literally just take it up and wiggle his post out and move it 20 feet away and do it again. And so it's very easy, but <laughs> the one thing he does get because of the way it's mounted, the wind will blow it sometimes to a different direction because that PVC pipe will rotate. And he said the bluebirds don't care which direction it faces. They'll fly out of it and the wind will change it and move it to another direction. They'll fly right back into it. So it doesn't matter the direction they face. The only key thing is to keep them 100 yards apart. But that's a great way of doing it because you can get predators other than raccoons in this. You can get black rat snakes that will climb a traditional post and go inside and eat the eggs. So if you mount it on PVC piping, uh, even if you've got it on a traditional post, if you measure the distance between the bottom of the box and the ground and then just slip a piece of PVC pipe over the post and then put it back on, that the PVC is too slick for anything to climb, basically. Okay? Okay. I do have on the same list that's got uh, the hummingbird flowers, there's also, the other thing you can do is start collecting different kinds of plants to put around your yard that will really create a sanctuary for, sanctuary for the birds. One of these is a list of berry producing native trees and shrubs. A lot of birds eat berries that bloom or ripen year, from about the first berry I think we have that ripens, the sarvis berry, and it usually ripens in early June. But beginning with sarvis berry, on through the season, plants like hackberry and uh, beauty bush. Uh, even flowering dogwood is a great tree to put in your yard because this time of year, you know, they're covered with those bright red berries. And I've even seen a pileated woodpecker land, because pileated is just like ivy bills. Traditionally, they eat insects, but if they're having trouble finding insects, they will eat soft mass. And one of the soft mass crops is those uh, red berries that are on flowering dogwood. Okay? So I've seen pileates land in a, in a flowering dogwood and pluck off those red berries. So uh, 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 holly, that's another great berry producing plant, but you want kind of plants that ripen throughout the season, particularly this time of year into winter. Beauty berry is a great shrub that has these magenta berries on it. This time of year, it's absolutely incredibly gorgeous, but those berries will be eventually eaten all through the winter. Mockingbirds are great berry eaters. Uh, bluebirds, when they can't find insects, will eat, also will switch over and start eating some berries. So any kind of berry producing tree and shrub that you can put in your yard. And as I said, I've got a list of starter plants here. And there's even some of the flowers that uh, like um, uh, purple cone flower. Uh, it gets those uh, marvelous uh, heads of seeds this time of year. And finches in particular, they eat seeds primarily and they will land on that seed head and it kind of, finch can eat upside down, literally, and they'll pluck out all the seeds. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of se uh, flowers on this list that you can have that bloom at different kinds of year and produce seeds as well. Okay, five minutes. <laughs> I think I got most of that in. Are there any questions? <laughs> I always am mindful, I always have to watch the clock and kind of work my way down. I did bring one live bird because uh, this is always, and I always save the live bird for the end. I think I gave this away a minute ago. This is an eastern screech owl. You can put up a screech owl box and there's, the dimensions are on the back of this. It's basically a little bigger than this and you need to mount it in a tree 15 or 20 feet tall. You do need to have woods near you or on your property. They are a woodland kind of bird. And they will use it year-round to roost in uh, because it's very dangerous to be asleep on a limb. When you're, well, let me get the little guy out. It's very dangerous to be asleep on the limb with a Cooper's hawk flying around. So they'll go into the box to roost year-round. And then uh, during nesting season, which is in the spring, um, if they can attract a mate, uh, they will nest in it. And now they don't bring any material in it. Screech owl, all owls don't add anything. They don't add any kind of nesting material. They're just looking for kind of a hollow hole somewhere. Okay, little guy, can you come out? Hey, baby. Hey, baby. 
Come on, baby. Come on, baby, baby. Oh, put your wings in. Come on, put your wings. Whoa, whoa, pull that wing in. I always eat. <laughs> it's the ah oh, moment. <laughs> This is one of our Eastern Screech Owls. That's another thing that we hope you become an I'm supporter on through Community Shares. We, we take in a lot of injured animals. We do not treat them. We do not have permits uh, to treat injured animals. All, all the phone calls we get about injured animals, we actually refer them to UT Veterinary Hospital. We have the largest, one of the largest avian hospitals in the country, so it's silly to come to us. But we do have permits to adopt an animal if it cannot be released. Now, most animals that are brought in that have been injured uh, are treated and eventually released, so they're returned to the wild. But uh, this little guy couldn't be because if you notice, if you look closely, he's only got one eye now. One of the eyes was badly injured. Hi, baby. Can you look around? So this eye over here, uh, they had to remove the eye and kind of sew the eyelid shut. So this uh, obviously... A bird of prey that does not have two good working eyes would starve and, uh, to death pretty quickly. So we'll take care of this little guy for the rest of his life. But this is an eastern screech owl. It's uh, really the smallest owl that lives here year-round. This time of year, we'll get solvet owls, which nest in the higher elevations of the Smokies, but kind of migrate to the lower elevations in the wintertime, which is a little tinier. But this is the owl that we have year-round. Uh, they're, they're much more common than you may think. Uh, if you live near woods, this is the owl you'll hear this time of year go, ooh, ooh, And what's going on this time of year, the young ones, uh, mom and dad is, have said, okay, it's time for you to move on. This is our home. You need to go find one. And so the new ones will go find pieces of property and call. And if they don't get, if they're not challenged by another screech owl, then they'll claim your area. And so if you, what they're looking for is obviously a lot of food. They eat mice, moles, voles, and shrews that they find here scamp scampering about in the leaves. And if you put up a nest box for them where they have a nice hidey hole to hide in during the day and then maybe uh, uh, raise their young in the spring, then that's an extra attractant for them. So you need a lot of mice principally. But um, uh, then you need a, a box for them, okay? Any adorable? The other species of owl that we have, I mentioned a saw wet, which kind of passes through uh, this time of year as it, as it moves a little further south to stay warm. They nest in the Smokies. The other two common ones uh, would be barred owl, and it's about this much bigger. Uh, it has bars on its belly. That's where it gets its name, and that's the one that's got the famous mnemonic, who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all. Uh, you can put up a barred owl box. It's even bigger than, say, this. And the call is something like, ho, 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 ho. It really draws. It's a nice southern owl. Ho, <laughs> draws out that last phrase. And then the large, classic, great horned owl, uh, not quite as common because they need a larger area, and we've gotten rid of a lot of large areas, but great horned owls, traditionally prefer pine lands, pine trees, but they will, they will uh, roost and nest in deciduous trees. But that's, and this is, uh, I'm starting to hear them. This is, uh, is, is uh, uh, mating season is start to begin for great horned owls, and so you can hear them in the middle of the night. Ooh, 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 ooh. Who's awake? Me too. And then you'll hear from the other ridge maybe, ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. And they're starting to court. Courtship begins for great horned owls in November into December. And usually she is on eggs by the mid-January. So it's the first bird in the calendar year to build a nest is the great horned owl. The last bird in the calendar year to build the nest is the American goldfinch. The American goldfinch waits for thistle seeds and the down that's on top of the thistle seeds to ripen because that's what she lines her nest with, and that's usually June. So nesting season in the Tennessee Valley really begins with great horned owl in January and kind of ends with uh, uh, the American goldfinch in June. Okay? We're out of time. Are there any questions, guys? Yes? I wanted to ask about painting the bird uh, mm -hmm. boxes or weather proofing them. What can you use? I mean, you know, I think you would paint that, but you would paint on the 
Well, this one, it, because this goes to a lot of schools, we just want to make it attractive for the kids to look at. Traditionally, you don't need to do anything because it just becomes like a weather barn, gray. and it, when, In essence, you're creating a fake uh, uh, hollow tree. So you really don't have to paint it. You don't have to do anything to it. It will age kind of nice and, and, and traditionally. You can, cedar is, um, is the best to build it out of because it lasts longer, but uh, I, most of the ones I build out, I build out of pine, and it lasts plenty of they last long enough. Any other questions, guys? Yes, here. Do you know what happened to the guy? Did someone bring him in and tell you? Uh, I don't know. He was really taken to UT Veterinary Hospital first, and they had to treat him, and they ended up removing his eyes. So I'm not sure what happened. Most screech owls uh, are hit by cars, believe it or not. In the summertime, under streetlights, all those big insects are flying around under a street light, and a screech owl will swoop low, even land on the pavement to grab that in and loon them off, and, or, or a cicada. And that's when they're hit by the car. So most screech owls, oddly, are hit by cars. Many obviously are killed, but many are just injured. And that could have been, I'm, I don't know, but that would be my first guess. Yes, in the back. No, as long as they're being used, they're fine. I did forget, uh, the other question I get is how often to clean the box out. Soon as you know the young have fledged, if you're watching it closely and you don't see any more activity, once the young fledge, they don't go back. And so clean it out because you can have one box that's used three times, not necessarily by the same species. They, bluebirds may use it three times or once the bluebirds move out, uh, tree swallows may move in. If you live in an open area, you guys out here near all the lakes, a tree swallow uses the exact same box as a bluebird. So if you clean it out at the end of every nesting, you might have the same box used three times by three different groups of three different pairs. But do this time of year make sure they're cleaned out because uh, bluebirds and other birds will use them on a cold day. They'll all go down inside to stay warm. And so they use it as kind of a hidey hole in the wintertime. So as long as the box is still being used, sometimes they'll be damaged. Often, uh, another bird will kind of start trying to make it bigger and get it bigger than that one inch and a half, which you don't want. And the best way to fix that is just to get a block of wood and just bore a brand new hole of an inch and a half and just nail it right on the front and you've got an extra kind of a new hole. So some of the boxes I have around, I just have to repair, you know, fix the roof or fix the hole over. So as long as it's been used, it's still fine. Yeah, it is important. I, I also, in some I build at home, will bore holes in the side just to keep it airy because it can get warm. Uh, it can get too warm. The other good thing is if you do have pines, bluebirds uh, use pine needles as their principal nesting material. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what, uh, if you've got a pine tree nearby that's got needles on the ground, then they'll, that'll make that box even more attractive to them. Because what he does, the male lands, the male bluebird, lands on the box and does his call, and he might, if he's got a female interested, he might even fly down and grab a needle and bring it inside. But once she kind of commits to him in the box, he says, okay, it's your and he guards the property, so she does everything else. Any other questions? Can you turn the album play a bit? Yes. I can do better than that. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> I knew I would get that one. Yes. The question is, how do you stop raccoons? It is gosh, they're tough. At Imes, we have gotten where we just take all of our feeders in. If you need to go, I understand because uh, I'm slightly over time. At Imes, we literally take our feeders in every night. You can buy a raccoon baffle which is like a big dome that you put below the feeder, which can work. Uh, raccoons are incredibly smart. The best thing I have at my house is all of my feeders hang from something. And so I, don't, I only have one feeder if it's on a post, and I don't use it year-round because I know I have issues with it. And it's got a raccoon baffle at the top, and I still have trouble. Um, the other, one thing you can try, there's a seed that I don't have samples of, but you can buy at certain places called safflower. It, uh, it is a little more expensive. You can buy a bag, and, uh, but it's very bitter. 
And I have t I've even tasted it. it is, we mammals have plenty of taste buds, and we don't like bitter. And I've got one feeder that I only use safflower in in the wintertime, and it keeps squirrels and raccoons from it because it's just too bitter to eat. And usually in the wintertime, they can find something better to eat than just safflower. So that's one thing you can try. But most of my feeders at home hang from a tree or from a guttering or something. And if you can hang them, it gets, raccoons can't quite reach them. Then you just got to figure out about a squirrel can climb down. So then you buy a squirrel baffle that goes on the top. And most places, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, will sell squirrel baffles that are really like a dome that the, ra the squirrel can't reach around and get to the goodies. OK, any other questions, guys? OK, thank you. I do have my handouts. Yeah. Did you see the letter to the editor in the latest issue? Oh, yeah. About the. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people. I, the, oh, the comments online. I didn't go back to the original article to take a look at the pictures. But, but what, what's the deal with it? Was that letter off, offline? Or, I mean, it was way offline. A lot, the comments online were even worse. One comment well, said. Online, I mean, oh, it's a magazine. Oh, yeah.